So for those of you guys who are unaware, Dr. Thrower is the medical director of the Andrew C. Carlos MS Institute at the Shepherd Center. He has previously served as medical director of the Holy Family MS Center in Spokane, Washington. Dr. Thrower is the senior medical advisor for MS Focus, and he enjoys contributing to our quarterly magazine. As always, Dr. Thrower, thank you so much for being with us today. I won't take up any more time, so I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for being patient. To, you know, when we're dealing with uh, the unpredictable nature of MS, MS was unpredictable this, this afternoon. And, and again, I appreciate everyone's patience. Everything's fine here on this end. We got a little medical emergency put out. So this afternoon, we're going to talk some about multiple sclerosis and vaccines. We've done a few programs on COVID and multiple sclerosis, and, and I'll touch on that briefly uh, towards the end, but it really, I think, prompted a larger discussion of, of just vaccines in general and, and you know, what are some of our guidelines. There's, there's, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of misinformation uh, out there, so we're going to take this on this afternoon. Um, so I wanted to just define a few terms first to make sure we're all on the same page. So one is, uh, is the concept of, of immunity. So immunity, just is, as we're talking more thinking about vaccines, would mean that you're protected from some kind of infectious disease. Um, if you are immune to, uh, to a disease, uh, you can be expected to either not get the, this infectious disease or to get less sick with it if you do get it. A vaccine is, is a, a, a preparation uh, that is going to be given uh, to hopefully stimulate the body's immune response against the disease. Uh, the vaccines are usually administered through an injection, although there are some, some oral vaccines that are out there, some, sometimes that are sprayed through an intranasal spray. Just because you get vaccinated, doesn't necessarily mean you have immunity. So the last term down, down there, immunization, means that your vaccine, your vaccination, actually did what we hope that it's, that it's going to do and that you have now immunity uh, through the vaccination process. Vaccination means just the act of giving that, that vaccine to somebody. So there are subtle differences between being vaccinated and being you know, immunized. You know, hopefully all vaccinations do result in, in immunization. So what do vaccines do? They, they generate an immune response. And so hopefully when you get a, a vaccine, you're generating both an, a B cell response and a T cell response. And hopefully those are going to, to be long lasting. And the way that vaccines give a long lasting immune response is through memory cells. So these are memory B cells and memory T cells. They're lying in wait in your body, waiting for that, that infectious agent to maybe to, to attack you. And then these memory cells are gonna spring into action and generate a protective immune response. So a lot of our ability to measure how well your vaccine has worked is really by measuring antibodies. You realize that the antibody response is just a small part of this overall vaccine response. You know, sadly, we don't have great blood tests to measure B and T memory cells. Um, a lot of times you actually have to do bone marrow uh, uh, biopsies to look for evidence of those, those cells. And obviously that's not something we want to do on a routine basis. So typically when we're looking for evidence of immunity, it's going to be through antibody testing. When I think about T cell testing, is there a way to you know, measure for T cell immunity? The only one that's widely commercially available right now is testing for tuberculosis. Uh, there is a, a blood test that looks for uh, T cell immunity to tuberculosis. There is a, uh, a test for COVID T cells, but it is in, a, it in theory is commercially available. It is just not very practical. Uh, we've looked into it here that I know a lot of people have, and it's just, it's very expensive. It's not very user friendly. So most of our, again, our testing to look for evidence that your vaccine has done uh, something is through antibodies, and that only represents a small part of the immune response. 
So we're going to go through the different types of vaccines, and then we'll talk about a, an example of each of these, these vaccine types and what that means for the person with multiple sclerosis. So a vaccine could be a live attenuated uh, vaccine. So this is typically a virus that's still alive, but it's been weakened somehow. And the hope is that by weakening it, weakening it, we're going to allow your immune system to generate an immune response, but not allow that live virus to actually cause the actual infection. Um, some viruses uh, can be actually uh, inactive or dead. So there's no way the virus can cause an active infection, but you're still gonna generate a good immune response to it. If we take just a piece of that infectious agent, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, uh, that's called a conjugate or a subunit vaccine. So it's just a lopped off little section of that uh, virus or bacteria that we're using. Something that none of us really spoke much about up until the COVID pandemic was the concept of messenger RNA and DNA vaccines. So this is taking a small piece of, of the, the, the messenger RNA, which is what makes protein, or the DNA, which is going to tell the, the, the body to make messenger RNA, which is going to make that protein. So this is going to make a small part of that virus. So it's it, it ends up sort of looking like a subunit vaccine, but you've got one extra step. You're sort of telling your body to make a little piece of that virus so that your immune system can, can th be fooled into thinking it has the infection and attack that, that, that uh, protein that, that uh, is uh, part of that virus so that you get an immune response. Viral vector vaccines, so this is using a, a benign virus, something that doesn't harm humans to carry a small piece of maybe that messenger RNA or DNA into your body, introduce it into our cells so that we make that little piece of the, of the virus so that we get that, that immune response. So it's, it's kind of one extra step. So you know, it, these things kind of build on each, each other. When you go from subunit to now having something make the subunit the mess or carry the information for the subunit, the messenger RNA or DNA, to now maybe something carrying that messenger RNA and DNA, the virus, and, uh, a benign virus. So these things are kind of just different uh, add-ons to that, that vaccine process. If an infectious agent makes you sick by making a toxin, Think about something like botulism or tetanus. We can actually vaccinate you by giving you a small piece of, of that toxin itself so that you're making antibodies to that toxin when you see it. Right? We'll talk about examples of, of, of those uh, toxoid vaccines. So the most common live attenuated virus vaccine would be our MMR, uh, measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, the, the varicella vaccine, chickenpox in children, is alive attenuated. That's different from the shingles vaccine that we get as adults. That we'll, we'll talk about that one later. Uh, so the varicella vaccine in kids is live attenuated. Shingles vaccine in adults is not live attenuated. And then some less common ones, uh, live attenuated uh, vaccines to rotavirus, typhoid, and adenovirus. So what about some of our dead uh, virus vaccines? The, the big one's gonna be your, your flu shot that we get every late summer or early fall. There was, and I think they may be reintroducing it, the flu mist, the nasal spray. That is a live attenuated, um, uh, so that's different from your normal flu shot. The, the flu shot that most of us get every year is, is a dead virus. Uh, other dead virus vaccines are hepatitis A, uh, polio, and rabies vaccines. So conjugate, or just a little piece of that infectious agent, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, pneumococcus, uh, which causes um, a lot of pneumonia in adults, meningococcal uh, uh, vaccines, uh, which prevents meningococcal meningitis, hepatitis B, uh, your human papilloma virus, which is a vaccine that came out a few years ago, uh, uh, looks a really big public health campaign to vaccinate young people to uh, hopefully help lower the incidence of cervical cancer, which is a, a downstream effect from, from HPV. Uh, whooping cough, 
and then our the shingles vaccine that we get as adults as opposed to the chickenpox vaccine that kids get our shingles vaccine is a, is a conjugate vaccine it's just a little piece of that that virus or bacteria and messenger rna again we we've, we've talked a lot about this in the past couple of years mainly with the covid vaccine so our covid vaccines are generally um, the, the messenger RNA uh, variety, both Moderna and Pfizer. Um, there are some DNA vaccines that are in research um, uh, for things like HIV, for uh, herpes, for Ebola, and for malaria. And then the viral vac uh, vector vaccine. So one of our COVID vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine. So they put their little piece of, uh, of genetic material into an adenovirus that adenovirus is going to then carry that genetic material to where it needs to be, but the virus itself is not causing any sort of infection. It's just the, the transportation that that uh, that is being used for that genetic information. Toxoid vaccines, uh, diphtheria uh, would be an example of a, of a uh, uh, toxoid vaccine, and tetanus would be another toxoid vaccine. So. What do we know about multiple sclerosis and vaccinations? You know, like any health decision, we really have to think about, you know, the, the benefits of, of, of the proposed treatment, in this case, a vaccination versus the potential risks. So some of the questions that we need to think about in the MS world is, could the vaccine cause a relapse? Could the vaccine give me the actual infection that I'm trying to, to prevent? And could the vaccine be less effective due to any of my MS uh, treatment that I'm on? We'll talk about all of those things. So fortunately, in terms of vaccines that would actually provoke a relapse, it's very unusual. Now, when we say these things you know, today, realize we're talking about the large population of people with MS. Within the MS community, because MS is so varied, you can find individuals who will say, I had a vaccine that should have been safe and should not have caused me any trouble, and I had a relapse. I hear individuals occasionally say, I got a flu shot and I had an MS relapse. We hear you, we're not discounting that. We're talking about the overwhelming majority of people with MS and then in admitting that there are, you know, sometimes individuals within that, you know, uh, bigger population that may not have read the rule book. So in terms of, of vaccines that we, we do have some concern about uh, relapses, yellow fever would be one. Fortunately, most of us don't need a yellow fever vaccine. You know, if you're doing work in, you know, in uh, South America or in Africa, it may come up uh, for you. Several studies have reported an increased risk of relapse uh, after yellow fever vaccine. A handful of studies didn't find it. I think, you know, if, if you're traveling to one of the, the uh, country where yellow fever is endemic, you're, you're going to need to have a talk with your, with your MS specialist and maybe even a travel doctor to say, okay, or, do I absolutely have to have this? Has my MS been well controlled? Am I at high risk for a relapse? And really think about the, the risks and benefits of, of getting that, that yellow fever vaccination. Same sort of story with Japanese encephal encephalitis vaccination. Again, most of us are never going to need a Japanese encephalitis vaccine. If you're traveling to some of the red areas on the on the map here, you know, mainly in the the uh, um, Pacific uh, Asian uh, regions, it could be something where you need to, to think about it. Um, it has been reported to, to uh, be associated with something called ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. This is a cousin of multiple sclerosis, and there has been you know, some caution advised about using it in people with MS because, uh, because of this other uh, demyelinating condition that has been seen as a side effect from, from that vaccine. So, so just like with yellow fever, it's going to you know, require a discussion with your, your MS team about where your MS is at, what your MS relapse risk is like, and whether the, the vaccine is, is worth it or not. So there, years ago, there were some reports that came out that, you know, looked at 
the risk of, of relapses or even the risk of MS itself of being caused by other vaccines. And the good news, is we've just not seen it. Multiple studies, multiple other vaccines have not shown a higher risk of MS relapses after vaccines, and these include uh, hepatitis B and influenza vaccines. Um, if you want a good uh, resource other than this presentation for you know for vaccine guidelines, a lot of this information can be find, found on the National MS Society website. They have a great vaccine page. They've worked hand in hand with the CDC to help d develop some some guidelines for people uh, with MS when they're thinking about various vaccines. So, what about live attenuated vaccines in MS? I mean, these are viruses that are not dead, they've been weakened, could they potentially cause the actual infection that you're trying to prevent in someone with a weakened immune system? So we do recommend caution and avoidance uh, with live attenuated vaccines in people who are immune compromised due to their MS therapy. Uh, so these would mainly be the MMR, the chickenpox vaccine uh, in, in younger people and the nasal influenza flu mist uh, vaccine. So, you know, you, if you're going on a therapy that could be potentially immunocompromising, you, we have to, you, know, you need one of these live attenuated vaccines. We generally recommend getting it before you start uh, the, the therapy, or if you've got to have one of these vaccines, maybe waiting until you're off of the therapy. Could so let's say a person who's immunocompromised and they're exposed to a child who just got the MMR vaccine or the chickenpox vaccine, could that child be shedding inactivated virus in a way that could potentially uh, infect the person with MS who's immunocompromised? There's no consensus on that. A lot of us feel like it, there, if there is any risk there, then it's got to be exceedingly low. Because um, we just, I can honestly say in the, the 30 years I've worked with MS, I, I don't think I've ever seen this, this happen. And clearly we've had immunosuppressive drugs over the years. So, so there is no consensus on whether family members of the individual with MS could potentially you know, transmit the infection by the family member getting the vaccine. But I, again, I think the risk is, is exceedingly low. Um, so what are the MS therapies that could potentially compromise the, the immune system? So our B cell therapies, uh, your, your Ocrevus, Rituxan, Casempta, Truxema medications, your S1P oral uh, modulator drugs, your uh, Gelenia, Zoposia, Mazent, Ponvori, uh, Lemtrada would probably be in this camp. Mavenclad is a maybe, um, the, their data, you know, when you look at the mechanism of action of Mavenclad, it looks like it should have the potential to be uh, something that would suppress the immune system. But the real world, world data has, has actually been fairly reassuring in terms of not seeing a very high risk of infections and, and people not really responding differently to vaccines. But I, I would just say, just uh, talk to your healthcare team if, if you're on Mavenclad as well. So could my MS therapy compromise the effectiveness of my vaccine? And we've definitely uh, become aware of this during the, the, the COVID pandemic. So MS, some MS therapies may decrease the antibody response seen after a vaccination. Uh, and this would mainly be our B cell therapies and our S1P therapies. So what about the, the uh, influenza vaccine? I, mean, I would argue this is probably the most common vaccination that all of us think about every year. Uh, so the flu shot is an inactivated or dead uh, virus. Uh, flu mist is a live attenuated virus. Um, so flu shots are, are considered to be safe and are generally recommended for pretty much everybody, MS or not. Um, obviously, if you're in a higher risk uh, occupation, physician, school teacher, something like that, you know, it, it's probably a good idea to get a flu shot each year unless you've had some kind of medical issue with it. Um, you know, if you have a lower risk of exposure, you're at home most of the time, you can kind of make your decision you know, and, uh, you know, for, for yourself as to whether uh, you want to get a flu shot each year. Um, but for most people, it's probably a good, good idea 
you know, influenza, we've become very comfortable with it, but it still kills you know, a lot of people in the United States every year. And many of those people could have had their death or serious illness prevented by, by vaccination. Shingles vaccine, uh, so shingles and, and uh, chicken pox are both caused by varicella virus. Varicella is in the, the herpes virus family. Herpes viruses, uh, and this would also include Epstein-Barr virus, they live in our, our central nervous system forever. We never get rid of a herpes virus. They are always with us. They use nerves uh, to travel to the skin surface. That's what shingles is. It is that uh, chicken pox virus, varicella being reactivated and traveling down a nerve to the skin surface and then erupting at, at the uh, skin surface. Um, the um, shingles vaccine is, is a conjugate vaccine uh, given to older individuals. Um, people with MS over uh, the age of 50 might want to think about getting the shingles vaccine. It's a two-parter. Um, and you know, it's, it's not that most people with MS are at higher risk for shingles. It's that shingles is just a whole lot of not fun if you get it. And if any of you listening have had shingles, you know this. It, it can be incredibly painful. And you can be left with post-herpetic pain at the area of, of the prior skin eruptions that may last for months or even years in some individuals. It can be very, very, very uncomfortable. Pneumococcal pneumonia vaccine, uh, CDC recommends, recommends this uh, conjugate pneumococcal vaccine really for anyone over the age of 65. You know, as we get older and our immune systems kind of mellow out a little bit, sometimes they mellow out a little bit too much and we are at more risk for things like pneumococcal pneumonia. You know, a pneumococcal pneumonia that may be a hassle for a 40 year old could be fatal in an 80 year old. So we would like to try to lower that risk with uh, pneumococcal vaccine. And that, that recommendation is really for anyone over 65 MS or not. So just a, 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 just a blurb on COVID vaccines. Uh, we've, we've talked of some of that about this before. You know, generally we feel like they are safe and we recommend them for people uh, with MS. The virus is changing. You know, our vaccines were really, really effective against the original COVID and against the Delta strain. But as COVID has kind of moved in this Omicron direction, they're still offering protection. But you know, people who are vaccinated and boosted can get Omicron. Uh, the data would say that the, the Omicron infection is less severe in people uh, who are vaccinated or, or boosted, but we don't want to mislead people and so you, you know and make people think if, if I'm boosted, I can't get Omicron. You can. It probably would just be a less severe infection for you. Um, the we talked about the disease modifying therapies that might lessen the effectiveness of of uh, vaccines, including the COVID vaccine. These are your B cell therapies and your S1P oral medications. If you are on one of those medications, talk to your healthcare team about getting what's in the picture here, the Evusheld product. So Evusheld is a COVID monoclonal antibody. It's actually two COVID monoclonal antibodies. So it's an intramuscular injection, one in each hip. These are passive antibodies. We're not asking your immune system to do anything. So everybody gets protection with Evusheld. We are offering this to all of our uh, patients on B cell therapies and talking about it with the, to our patients on one of the uh, the S1P, the Gelenia, Zoposia, Mazen, Ponvori type type medications. Um, the just two weeks ago, the FDA authorized second doses of Evusheld six months from the first uh, dose. Uh, so it kind of is a, it, it's a nice fit for someone on a drug like Ogrevus or Rituxan, you know, most of these individuals are coming in every six months to do their infusion. We can do the Evusheld on the same day and offer them COVID protection at the same time that they're getting their MS treatment. So kind of a little bit of, of a sidetrack here, but since we're talking about vaccines, what about vaccines as MS therapies? Can we take advantage of some of this technology and maybe turn around and use vaccines to actually treat MS. So a study that we were involved in years ago, and, and sadly it didn't work out, but there are still teams working on this out there, 
is actually a T cell vaccination against multiple sclerosis. One of the, the things that's been on everyone's wish list in the MS world is a customized therapy. What if I could have a customized MS treatment to my specific MS? And that's what these T cell vaccinations could potentially represent. So the way that these work is through blood draws, you, you took off the a, a population of the inflammatory T cells from the individual with MS. So these are their T cells. Send them to a laboratory and, and clone them. Make a whole bunch of this person's very specific bad guy T cells are causing some of the damage. And now we're going to inactivate. We're going to weaken those cells just a little bit and give them back to that person as a subcutaneous injection. The person's immune system would see that weakened T cell and actually make an immune response. So you're vaccinating yourself. You're making an immune response against your very own bad T cells. So hopefully that your own immune system is now going to downregulate those inflammatory T cells. Um, it didn't work out in the study that we did uh, a few years ago, but again, uh, th there are other teams still working on this idea. One of the positives of the COVID pandemic was uh, a, sort of a spinoff of looking at messenger RNA vaccines uh, like that we're using to prevent COVID, trying to modify those to being able to, to be used to treat MS. And the concept is immune tolerance. So BioNTech, the team that partnered with Pfizer, is looking at an MS vaccine. So they would have a small amount of DNA that codes for myelin basic protein, uh, have the messenger RNA that codes for myelin basic protein. That is the vaccine. You're telling your cells and your body now to make small amounts of myelin basic protein in a way that now your immune system, rather than attacking myelin basic protein, would start tolerating myelin basic protein. So in some ways you could argue it's sort of like getting an allergy shot. So you're, you're let's say you're allergic to ragweed. Well, what if you did sort of small subcutaneous injections of ragweed over time, you're teaching your immune system to tolerate rather than attack. And that's what the BioNTech team is working on in the MS world. And that would be wonderful if we had you know, an MS vaccine that you could do on a once a year basis you know, and take the place of maybe something, some of our other uh, other options that we have right now. So I think that was our whirlwind tour through vaccine overview. Um, we will throw it open for comments and questions at this point and see what's on everyone's mind. Thank you, Dr. Thrower. So if you are watching from Zoom, there are a few different ways to ask questions or leave comments. You can either type them into the chat or the Q&A box. If you prefer to ask questions anonymously, the option that you would choose is the Q&A feature. And if you'd like to speak directly to Dr. Thrower, you can use the raise hand feature as well. If you're watching from your phone, and you want to ask Dr. Thrower a question, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Otherwise, it's at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. And if you're watching from Facebook, of course, you can type your questions into the comments section and we'll get to them soon. So it looks like we do have a few already. And I'll start with Cindy. Uh, she has a comment and a question. Essentially, she wants to know what your opinion is on WJ MSC transplant via IV. She says MSC from Wharton Jelly seems to be quite effective being admin via IV. She said this is approved in um, other countries, but not here yet. Therefore, it has to be paid by the individual. So there's it's a little off the topic of vaccines, but so the whole idea of, of mesenchymal stem cells, you know, as a reparative or is, I think most of us think of mesenchymal stem cells as something that would repair damage in the central nervous system and hopefully reverse disability. There's some hope that maybe mesenchymal stem cells do more than that. Maybe they actually have an immunomodulatory effect. Um, it, that research is moving along. So I, you know, I know it feels probably to the MS community like it's moving at a snail's pace. But so 15 years ago, or maybe a little bit more now, um, 
a large portion of the, the research dollars that the National Medical Society raises were dedicated to neural repair. A lot of that early research was at the animal or laboratory level, but now you're seeing it starting to, to build into the human uh, arena. So for instance, we're working with a, a, a research group called MSTEM, IM STEM, with the mesenchymal stem cell study. It's phase one, it is early. Um, but it feels like we're moving. And I would say just stay tuned. You def, you know, when we make our healthcare decisions, we have to be smart healthcare consumers. And it's, it's hard when you feel like things are moving slowly, you get almost a sense of desperation. And so don't let yourself get taken advantage of. So you know, it's frustrating if a therapy is not available here in the United States and you say, well, gosh, I could go to this country and get this mesenchymal stem cell uh, therapy or whatever therapy you're looking at. Just do your homework. Uh, you know, the one of uh, our you know, MS doctor, the, Dr. Fred Loblin, you know, used to say that the plural of anecdote is not data. So just because someone has several testimonials on their website, saying, you know, hey, I, I did treatment X and I got better. That's not the same thing as research. So I would say mesenchymal stem cells are definitely moving along. It may be one of the many avenues or, that, that pay off in the future for reversing disability. Um, not, not quite ready outside of research for prime time yet. Okay. So I do see in the chat, we have a question from Greg. Uh, and before I get to that, I just want to let the people who have their hands raised, let them know that we will get to you as soon as possible. Just hang in there with us. So Greg asks, if people have had the Epstein-Barr virus or mono, can a yellow fever vaccine ignite MS? Yeah, so Epstein-Barr virus, there's been a lot of interest. You know, we've always known that it, it is linked to MS. There was uh, a big leap forward in our research uh, about four months ago, where the the uh, teams at Stanford uh, were able to show the amino acid sequences on the Epstein Barr virus that are be generating a, an autoantibody and what that antibody is attacking in the central nervous system. So we know a lot more about Epstein Barr virus. I've never seen anything specific to yellow fever vaccine and Epstein Barr virus. So you know, we know that yellow that some studies have indicated that yellow fever could be associated with an MS relapse, but I don't think to my knowledge that it's mediated through any interactions with Epstein-Barr virus. I, I think those are two separate issues. I am going to ask Jill if she wouldn't mind unmuting herself. Um, you can speak to Dr. Dora whenever you're ready. Jill, are you there? We can't hear you. I can't hear her. I don't think you can either. So we'll come back to you. Um, Karen, are you there? I unmuted. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Dr. Thrower, thank you so much for your time. I, just, I don't get this information from anybody else at any other time. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And many people are. Um, if you were to get COVID, which so far I have not, I take Kisanta. I have been for a couple of years. Um, I did take Ebusheld. Uh, is there any possibility that I would develop some sort of antibody response from natural infection? Would I have any hope that I'd get a T cell or two out of natural infection, or is it just going to be a, a waste of my time? Should I yeah, get? No, great question. So what? So while most people on a B cell therapy like Casempta don't develop antibody, COVID antibodies to vaccination, and it, and that probably would apply to natural infection as well, that doesn't mean you don't get a T cell response. So what the studies have shown is that almost everyone on B cell therapy still gets a good T cell response to vaccination. And we would think that applies to natural infection too. The problem in the real world is we just don't have a great blood test to measure that T cell response. But the studies would say you should, should have gotten it. 
So you should, you know, with your vaccinations and boosters have gotten a T cell response. And now with your Evyshell, you've got a wonderful antibody response. Yeah, I would say the Evyshell gives as good of an antibody response as anything out there, natural infection or, or vaccination booster. So you know, hopefully you're, you're well protected at this point. You know, the other thing I think that we all have going for us is again, that, that COVID seems to be mutating in, in a good direction in terms of being less virulent. Uh, a lot of people that are getting Omicron right now wouldn't want to have it necessarily, but they're saying it's, it's, you know, was, was more like a really bad cold uh, than what we were seeing with Delta, which was putting people in the hospital ICU or, or killing them. I understand. Um, well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. We have a question in Q&A from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they said they've had shingles four times over the last 35 years and would like to get the vaccine, but they are apprehensive because of their history. What's your opinion? So having had shingles in the past would, would not make me nervous about getting the shingles vaccine. It would make me want to get get the vaccine yesterday. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so that, that person can probably you know testify that shingles is not fun. So, you know, we don't know why some people are, are prone to getting recurrent shingles. You know, you would like to think our immune system can keep that virus at bay, but clearly in this individual, something about their immune system is just not able to keep it in check. So hopefully by doing the shingles vaccine, that's going to give them the, the weapon that they need to, to not have any more bouts or shingles. Yeah, I, I, I would go ahead with it. Would you recommend the same for Susan? Uh, she says in the chat that she got shingles two weeks ago and she's still fighting through it. She's never had the vaccine. She's 63 and has steady MS. Yeah, I, I think she's going to want to get the vaccine, but you're going to want to wait till that shingles clears up. To so I would probably you know, wait um, a good ninety days, but uh, let those lesions really crust over, heal up, because uh, doing the vaccine now, you you that immune response that you're generating, she's generating some degree of a natural res immune response right now. I don't think it would be wise to do the vaccine in the setting of having an active shingles infection. I, I would let that crust over and then get it to prevent the next bout. So let me jump back to uh, Jill, who had her hand raised previously. Jill, are you there? Can you hear us? You have to unmute. Hmm. I don't know why, I hope she can. Jill, if you're having difficulty, you can type your question into the chat or the Q&A box, but we will um, move on. Diane, are you there? Guess not either. Oh, I see you unmuted. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. <laughs> okay. And if Jill's having any technical issues, you know, she can always email the question to, to you folks there and, and you guys can just shoot it over to me. Okay, Diane, I'm going to recommend the same. Uh, if you reply to your registration email, um, we can kick those questions over to Dr. Thrower and that's for anyone, depending on how much time Dr. Thrower has to take questions. If we don't get to you, we will uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so Mimi in the chat wants to know, what if you are asymptomatic with no vaccine in regards to COVID? So we're, you know, we definitely started seeing that with Omicron. I remember back in December when when BA1, the first version of Omicron, you hit. Uh, my wife's a pediatrician, and they would have families traveling, and you know, and you'd have teenagers showing up who test positive for for COVID, but they were completely asymptomatic. Um, I I would just count your blessings that you that you're. Yeah, that you're following a very, very mild course. Um, you know, certainly use precautions, but you know, just because you're asymptomatic doesn't mean you couldn't still transmit it to somebody else. So you know, do appropriate isolation for yourself and uh, maybe get retested at some point to, to see if you're negative. Um, uh, but yeah, th there are clearly asymptomatic individuals out there. 
there's always the possibility of a false positive too. I think that's unusual, but any time of, you know the, a test doesn't fit the clinical situation, then we always at least have that in the back of our mind. But but I clearly have seen individuals who have no symptoms or very very mild symptoms, but clearly have COVID. Mm -hmm. Cindy in the Q&A has another question. She says, what is the best way to look at gray matter for any active MS deep in the brain that may not be detected on a basic MRI? So we're really coming to understand that the deep gray matter structures in multiple sclerosis are really, really important. So things like the thalamus that if you really look at predictors of disability in MS, you know, all these big bright white spots that we see on traditional MRI, they're, they're so obvious to us and they're important, but they may not really be predictive of how the person with MS is doing that, that you know, harder to measure thalamic damage or other deep gray structures is probably more clinically uh, meaningful. Um, it's hard for most people, myself included, in the in a clinical practice to look at someone's thalamus and say, yeah, you, you look okay, or no, that looks a little atrophied. It really takes um, uh, more volumetric measures. So these are computer programs that, that actually measure the, the uh, thalamus or whatever gray structure you're, you're looking at. Uh, cortical gray, the, 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 the crinkly, wrinkly part of the gray matter on the outside of the brain or the deep gray structures. So we know it's important. Uh, we also know that we're going to have to use some of these uh, objective computer-based volumetric studies to, to measure that stuff. It's kind of cool when you think about it because we're really moving into an era where, where very objective outcomes are going to be an important part of measure of monitoring people's MS. So you know, when we think about the electronic medical record, you know, I, I see a day coming when all of the important outcomes that you have, so whether it's your time 25-foot walk, your nine hole peg test, your cognitive test with a, a simple digit modality test, and then some of these MRI metrics would be graphically laid out in the person's electronic medical record. So the, the healthcare team could pop this up and say, yeah, this is how they, they've done over the past five years. And you know, either they're stable or no, I'm concerned because this whatever metric I'm looking at is dropping a little bit. So yeah, all of these outcomes are gonna be increasingly important and hopefully measurable over time. Kathy says she's 63 and she's presently on Ocrevus. Uh, do you highly recommend Evisheld? Also, since I got my last booster in October, are, are they are recommending being boosted a third time for those with MS. Yeah, I, I will tell you that the, the research experience and our personal experience uh, says that the majority of our Ocrevus patients with vaccination and boosters are not making a lot of antibodies. And so I, I at a minimum, I think everyone with Ocrevus needs to get their COVID antibodies tested if they've been vaccinated and boosted to see if they actually got an antibody response and realizing that the majority of those people are not going to have an antibody response. I think we need to be pretty liberal in offering Evusheld to, to, to individuals like, like herself. An anonymous attendee in Q&A wants to know if it's safe to get the vaccines while taking Kisenta. Uh, that takes away B cells. I'm not sure which vaccines they're referring to. So you would you would want to be cautious with the live attenuated vaccines. And again, you can pop back and sort of look, take a look at those things like the measles, mumps, rubella, um, flu vaccine, fine, shingles vaccine, fine. Um, but your live attenuated, I would be cautious about receiving while you're on on Cosempta. Um, just going back to the uh, previous question asker uh, that, that came up, uh, just uh, another point on that. So if you're receiving Evusheld, in my book, that kind of trumps getting another booster. So the purpose of the booster is to generate an immune response. Well, if we're giving you a passive immune response to the Evusheld, I would argue you probably don't need a booster if you've, if you've received Evusheld. Again, Evusheld is going to probably last you for about six months. Where life gets a little weird is if you are traveling or if you're in a job where they require that you be boosted, sadly, our, a lot of our government agencies are not globally are not thinking about immunity. So my, when I think about travel or an occupation, I want to know whether you're immune to something. 
I don't care if you've got immune to it through Evyshelv or a vaccine or natural infection. Sadly, that's not the way a lot of our, our government agencies are thinking. They just want to show that you're vaccinated. So just because you've received Evyshelv, if you are traveling to a country that requires that you have a vaccine or a booster, that, that may not let them check their box on that that uh, sort of travel form. So that's just one little quirk of uh, this big weird world that we're living in right now. And I, I, yeah, I don't know how we fix that. We've got a question from another anonymous attendee. Uh, she says that she's been on Tizabri for nine years and is JC positive. And what your thoughts on, on the shingle, what your thoughts are on the shingles vaccine? Yeah, so the, the, the beauty of Tysabri is it's really not immunosuppressant. So it's, it's you know, preventing inflammatory cells uh, trafficking across the blood-brain barrier and into your brain and spinal cord. Uh, something about that trafficking in people who are JC virus positive does you carry some PML risk, but that is the only infection that we really see. So it's, it's not that you're globally immunocompromised on Tysabri. It's just really that PML discussion that we need to have. So the shingles discussion for someone on Tysabri, really, you, you, that person can make their shingles vaccine dis decision just like anybody else out there. So I, I think in general, it's probably a good idea, you know, whether you're on Tysabri or not, or whether you have MS or not. So she certainly can get it, the shingles vaccine safely. And Sandy has another question in the chat. She asks uh, if COVID vaccines reactivate the EBV, which is a precursor for MS. Yeah, so so not I have not seen any data that would suggest that that the COVID vaccines you know, would reactivate Epstein Barr virus. So again, think about what the COVID vaccines are. They're, you know, they're generating their messenger RNA vaccines. They're making a little bit of that COVID spike protein. Your immune system mistakenly thinks you have a COVID infection, is getting is then making an immune response to that. Um, I haven't seen anything in the data that would suggest that that then reactivates Epstein uh, Barr virus. Um, but yeah, the, but her other point that Epstein Barr virus is, you know, we've always known it was important. And with this recent research out of Stanford, we, I think we have a much better grip on how that works, how Epstein Barr virus might send someone down the MS pathway. And hopefully, what that leads to is some newer treatments and newer ways of attacking or maybe preventing MS through this, maybe interrupting that Epstein-Barr virus interaction. Susan in the chat wants to know if shingles uh, affects MS and makes it worse or causes exacerbations. Yeah, so, so any viral infection that revs up your immune system has the potential to make MS symptoms worse. And so shingles would certainly be right along with that. So when you have a shingles infection, your immune system is going haywire to try to put that fire out. And those shingles infections last for days and days and days. Uh, so it would not be unusual at all to see someone have new or worsened neurological symptoms with a shingles infection. Technically, we would call that a pseudo exacerbation or pseudo relapse. It, it was provoked by something. It was provoked by the infection. I think as far as the individual suffering from it, it, it doesn't matter if we call it a relapse or a pseudo relapse. The symptoms are real uh, and, it, and they're not fun. So yeah, there, there is that virus MS interaction because of the immune response to the virus. And we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they said they have MS, uh, but they don't have a spleen, and it was removed at three months old, and they wanted to know if they should still get the shingles vaccine. So, you know, having had a splenectomy, I mean, that does carry certain other infection uh, risks. Um, I've not seen anything in the data that would suggest that the person with a splenectomy is at higher risk for shingles. There are other infections that you, you carry a higher risk for with splenectomy, but I don't think shingles is one of them. So I think that the, even though that's a unique situation, that person can probably make their, their shingles vaccine decision just like anyone else would. Again, generally would recommend it. Um, I would bounce that off your primary care doctor as well. Um, 
yeah, just to get one more thought on that. That's kind of a unique situation. Mm -hmm. Karen in the chat uh, wants to know, or she says she's had a massive physical deterioration right after her COVID booster, Moderna COVID booster at the end of 2021. And between April of this year and July, her MRIs were stable and she's had no new or active lesions. Is it possible that her booster impacted her MS? So the, the studies would say no, but again, a study is looking at large populations of people. And I think we have to be humble enough to say, you know, there are individuals who just are not playing by the, the rules that everyone else is playing by. So I'm also a big believer in, in listening to people. And if people say, you know, I did X, whether it's vaccination or, or whatever, and I had why happen and nothing else changed, we should listen to that and respect it. So we know that vaccines do generate an immune response. Every vaccine known to man has been associated with some small risk of autoimmune reactions, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, transverse myelitis, acute disseminated myelitis, Bell's palsy. So I, I don't think it's totally crazy to say that you know, there may be a rare individual out there who has an immune reaction to a vaccine that was more than what we wanted and could have something like she's experiencing. Again, assuming every, everything else was stable and that was the only variable that changed, it, it's certainly possible. It would obviously make someone a little nervous about getting more boosters going forward if she had that experience with the last one. Dr. Thrower, how much time do you have for questions? We have quite a few to get through, and I know. Uh, uh, sadly, I probably need to wrap up. Let's say 4.35 if we can, okay. maybe seven more minutes. Sure. So Laura in the Q&A asks if there is a waiting period after pneumonia vaccine or before Ocrevus infusion. So there's not a safety concern. The, the, the timing discussion with Ocrevus and vaccines really has to do with you're trying to get the biggest effect from the vaccine that you can. And so in theory, the, the further you are away from the, your Ocrevus infusion, the more likely it is that you get a good immune response to the vaccination. But on the other hand, you don't want to get you don't want to butt right up into the, your Ocrevus infusion. You know, so, so generally, you know, I tell people kind of the midway point, you know, three months or so is probably the, the safest bet. Assuming you're on a six month rotation with, with your Ocrevus, that probably gives you the best chance of getting a good immune response to, to the vaccine. And Gwen says that she's a teacher and she wants to know, should she be looking at getting a third booster or get the Evi shelf instead? She says, would you still recommend wearing masks in the classroom when school starts again? So I'm assuming she must be on Ocrevus. Um, assuming that she is, then, then I would definitely have the Evisheld discussion. And if you do Evisheld, again, that kind of trumps the booster. So I would argue if you've gotten Evisheld, you probably don't need the booster. You know, I would never tell someone to not mask. We don't have any preventative, whether it's COVID vaccine, Evisheld, we don't know of anything that's 100% effective. And if you know if, if she would like to to put as many barriers you know every shell social distancing masking in place to protect herself i don't think anyone should question her uh, on doing that so I, I think you know if classroom setting it's you know depending upon the ages of the kids i mean there, there, there's a lot of germs and whatnot going on in there so yeah i i certainly wouldn't fault her for wearing a good kn95 mask in that setting yeah, I was going to ask, um, because I believe the KN95 masks are more effective, so thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, and if you're, when you do your, look at your KN95 masks, make sure you've got a legitimate KN95 mask. There should be a series of little numbers. I'm looking here at the one I have, so I don't know if people can see that, but there's a KN95 stamped on it and then below that there's a little series of numbers if your mask only has kn95 on it and no numbers you don't have a real kn95 mask and there's a lot of uh counterfeits out there i mean i've bought bad ones on on amazon before i knew that 
that that's what they were. So just make sure you're getting legitimate KN95 masks. They're not any more expensive than the counterfeits. So Elizabeth in Q&A, uh, her question I'm assuming is um, what the efficacy is on if you get a flu shot if you're on B cell DMT. Yeah, so the you're still going to get your T cell response, but you may not get the full antibody response. You know, if you're on a B cell therapy, um, I, I've not seen any data in terms of how that translates into your clinical protection. So you may not have as many antibodies, but your T cells may still be um, protecting you. I would assume just to, to be on the safe side, I, I think it's still worth getting the flu shot if you're on a B cell therapy, but I would assume that you may be a little bit less protected and just act accordingly. You know, if you're in a high risk situation, a classroom, a, a plane, you know, maybe throwing on that, that mask in those settings just to protect yourself. You know, one thing we learned from the COVID pandemic is that the masks are really effective at preventing influenza. Uh, we saw almost no influenza in that, that first winter of the COVID pandemic. So they do a great job with, with influenza. And a question in the chat from Steven, who says that he's been on Thai South 3 for years and wants to know if it's okay to get vaccinations. He doesn't specify uh, which ones. Yeah, so so Tysabri is pretty easy in the, in the vaccine discussion. So really, we we don't have to make any special accommodations with Tysabri as it relates to vaccines. So really, the person on Tysabri can make their vaccine discussion really just like almost any individual out there uh, because of, of it, not having the potential to immunocompromise or deplete B cells or anything. So that that one's a pretty easy one to work with. Um. I have a question from David in Q&A. He wants to know if it's possible for the yellow fever vaccine to cause or increase the possibility of getting MS. So I've never seen any data on yellow fever actually causing MS. Again, there's, there's information out there on it you know, provoking relapses. You know, when you think about what causes MS, so it's, it's this confluence of, of genetics and environmental factors. I could, just thinking worst case scenario, let's say that you had all the genes to, to put yourself at risk for MS, you've had the, the right exposures, maybe Epstein-Barr virus, and MS is just lying in wait under the surface. Maybe the yellow fever vaccine could be that final straw that unmasks your first relapse. So in that way, it didn't really cause your MS, it just provoked a relapse that then made the MS manifest for, for, for someone. Looks like we've got time for one more question. Uh, Sherry Benz wanted to know uh, if her meds make her vaccine response to the COVID low, should she get shingles, flu, tetanus, hep B vaccines, or boosters? Yeah, so so because we would want to, again, maybe not, not get the live attenuated, but all the other, the inactive, the conjugate. I would still argue that it's worth getting those because even though she's gonna have an attenuated antibody response, she's still getting a B cell response. And I would argue something's better than nothing. You know, the alternative would be to go off of Ocrevus or wait to delay a dose, get all those vaccines, but then you're butting up against the risk of the MS flaring up. So I, I think weighing the risks and benefits, I would probably do the vaccines, get the T cell response, not everybody with onofus has an absent antibody response. The majority do, but but I just saw a gentleman today who's on onofus who has crazy high levels of COVID antibodies from vaccines and boosters. Uh, he's not received Shell. So there are people who do still get the antibody response. So I, I still think that the benefit is there. It just may not be as much clinically, but it's better than not uh, having any protection. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot more questions in the Q&A, but I know you have to run, Dr. Thor. So everyone whose question has not been answered, please respond to your registration email. And we'll kick those questions over to Dr. Thor as soon as we get them. And as soon as possible, he'll be able to answer them and we'll get them back to you guys. 
But that is all the time we have for today. And if you missed any part of this conference, it will be replayed on the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation uh, YouTube channel. But you can also go straight to our Facebook page because after the stream ends on Zoom, it'll be available to watch there again. So if you missed it, you can always just go back to that. Uh, please follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next conference will actually be with Sherry Benz next Tuesday afternoon, July 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, where she'll be discussing symptom management. Um, as usual, we thank you so much, Dr. Thrower, for your time. And the year is winding down, and you and I have some holiday trivia to put together. Absolutely. <laughs> we will keep working on it. Awesome. So everybody, please stay safe out there. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care.